Hi, I'm Christian Schiller, and in this video, I'm going to discuss a topic I have been digging into, and that is the topic of dynamic documentation. Let's begin with a question. What do America Online, the Apple Newton, DVDs, Tamagotchis, MP3, PDFs, and Sony Discmans all have in common? They were all products that were born, and in some cases died, in the 1990s. And I am unfortunately old enough to remember many of them, some of them fondly. But do you know what else was born in the 1990s? Hypertext markup language, known to you and me as HTML, more commonly known as web pages. I will get to the actual topic of dynamic documentation very soon, but just humor me for a moment and join me on one of my favorite tasks, which is a trip down computing memory lane. HTML is a static presentation technology with much of its markup language inspired by and based upon the desktop publishing world. 30 years later, it still kind of shows these roots with layout being quite strict and quite linear and grid-like. It has added support for many things in its lifetime, and more recently, tags, these are the building blocks of HTML that represent the modern needs and requirements and uses of HTML on web pages. What has changed is the way that we create those pages. Most web pages are a combination of HTML plus potentially CSS, cascading style sheets, which are a way of centralizing the look and feel of a web page, kind of like style guides in desktop publishing, and JavaScript, which allows for some interaction and dynamism in a page. And the HTML creates the layout and ties the other technologies together. Initially, these other technologies and HTML itself were quite limited, and we needed other tools to fill those gaps. Things like Flash, Director, Silverlight, and of course, jQuery, which enhanced a lot of JavaScript back in the early days. But it may surprise you to know that jQuery is still actually quite widely used, despite what a lot of web developers think and maybe indeed hope. Okay, so that's the end of the potted history lesson. My question to all of you who produce documentation is, now we have all these fantastic advancements in web technologies from the past 30 years. Why do we insist on still having such static walls of text? And this is where the potential of dynamic documentation enters. But first, a disclaimer. I cover the docs as code approach to documentation. Look that up if that doesn't mean anything to you because it's quite a big topic and I don't have time to go into any great detail here but I am fully aware there are probably other ways of generating what I will call dynamic documentation through content management systems, portals, and other tools. But I am gonna to stick to that docs as code approach. So what are some of the concepts we could think about with dynamic documentation? Some of these are also in what I will call static documentation, but these are some of the main things I was trying to create when I started looking into the subject. So. This is the list I will start with. Perhaps we want to reuse content. It's been a common practice for some time to try and single source content as much as possible so you can only edit in one place and it updates in multiple places. Another was getting content from other sources. This could be APIs, headless CMS, and maybe other repositories of markdown files, for example. Screenshots. A picture can speak a thousand words, but they're always complicated to create reliably and consistently. And so how could we generate screenshots with reliable, consistent, and useful demo data in them? User data inside docs. You do sometimes see this on some documentation sites, but it's not that common. So instead of showing generic examples, how about we show examples with things like access keys pre-filled in the code. Interactive playgrounds. Sometimes the best way for people to learn is not by reading, but by experimenting. So perhaps we could mix documentation and that potential to experiment into one place. The ability to use documentation content in other places. Why restrict someone to reading documentation in one place when we can take that documentation to where they are working directly. As with any development task, there's multiple ways you could do this. I'm gonna to stick to predominantly just 
two here. But there are many ways you could do it, and I will mention some of the others in passing. I will mostly be looking at Docusaurus and Astro. Astro is a general purpose tool, although it does currently have a documentation sort of spin-off project, but it's quite new. It has a very full feature set, but is not completely optimized for documentation at this point. Docusaurus is specifically aimed at documentation. It's much more mature, but has less of the options available than Astro because of this. There's also Gatsby, which is worth an honorable mention, but it has become quite complex recently, so I tend to skip it these days and just stick to those two. Astro and Docusaurus are React-like tools. I say React-like because Docusaurus is based on React, but Astro isn't. But what it is based on is very much inspired by React. What is React? React is a JavaScript framework initially created by Facebook, now Meta, that brought many new paradigms when it was released, some of which already existed and it is popularized, but that's often the way. One of the fundamental ideas it has, which is a bit of a paradigm shift if you come from more traditional web development, like I did, and I'm still trying to get my head around it, is that it makes everything a component that can be treated in many different ways. I won't get into that, but think of everything as a component. The page is a component. The menu bar is a component. The menu items in that menu bar are subcomponents of the menu, of the page, etc., etc. But where it gets very interesting for us is that the content is also a component. Another commonality of many of these tools is that whilst you can use Markdown, a popular text format for people writing documentation, they also use a flavor of Markdown called MDX. And what is MDX? MDX mixes Markdown syntax with the syntax of components. This is interesting for a couple of different reasons. First, we get yet another flavor of Markdown syntax that strangely, because it's following paradigms from a development tool, actually becomes more standard and a more standard way of doing some of the special formatting that we often want in Markdown in documentation that each of the tools we've probably used have different ways of doing. But because you're using some standard React-like components, you kind of get a more standard flavor of Markdown, interestingly. And there is, of course, a very rich ecosystem around MDX. And this comes in the shape of manipulation tools, Remark and Rehype, for manipulating the Markdown and generated HTML, respectively. I understand that this is all starting to sound a little bit complex if you don't come from a development world and more of the writer world. But I'm going to show a few examples now. And I will try to dig into some of these from a documentarian's perspective in more detail in future videos and blog posts. So keep an eye out for those and just bear with me for now. So with those concepts out the way, how can we apply some of them to some of the features that I mentioned earlier? Let's start with content reuse first. There are myriad different ways to do this with current tools, usually involving some kind of include file parameter. Remember that I said content is also treated as a component. And every Markdown or MDX file can be, depending on the tool, also treated as components in themselves. So what does this mean? Well, if we want to include some content in one of those files, we include it as a component and it's rendered in line with all the other text around it. You can even pass variables to those content components for even more flexibility. Maybe even those variables could come from user data, giving some really interesting dynamism and variability in the single sourcing of that content component. Content from other sources. What about APIs? They power and fuel a lot of the application interconnectivity on the web. And whilst documentation sites often devote a lot of time to explaining how to use them, we could also fetch content from them. You could, for example, dynamically load data from sources such as issue trackers, support sites, roadmaps, and 
headless CMS, amongst many other things. Here's an example from my personal website, which uses Astro to fetch data from podcasts and video sources and render them in the web page. Screenshots, the bane of our existence, but often so useful for explaining concepts. Keeping them up to date takes time and getting meaningful data into the screenshots is also a complicated thing to set up. Here's an interesting idea. If your application front-end team is also using tools like React, and there's a possibility they are, then they also have their own components that you're probably trying to take screenshots of. So instead of screenshots, you could potentially load some of those front-end components into your documentation live. No more screenshots, actual living documentation that represents the user interface in this case in line amongst the explanatory content. You could also load user data into those components, meaning that instead of screenshots that you have to keep updating, you now have living example components in the documentation showing data completely relevant to the person reading it. This is definitely one of the harder ideas to implement, especially loading in that dynamic data, but in the long run, it could really pay off. This leads very nicely to interactive playgrounds in documentation. These are not new concepts and have existed in multiple different ways for some time, especially in API documentation. But personally, I've always found them to be the most effective ways of explaining very complicated concepts and worth the effort of creating them. But based on and building upon many of the ideas I've covered so far, you start to realize that creating interactive playgrounds, especially in line in the documentation becomes, if not easier, makes more sense and the tool chain start to overlap a lot more. So far, I've talked about the impact on documentation sites themselves. What about outside of those? Whilst this idea is not restricted to some of the tooling and ideas I've mentioned in this video, it's made easier in some ways by them. For example, converting your written content to pure JavaScript or JSON formats. And this is made easier by leveraging plugins and tools from the whole Remark and Rehype ecosystem. And I think we all know how flexible formats like JSON can be. But even more interesting, remember that I said that everything is a component? Well, effectively, this means that your entire documentation is also a component. And you could include it in other applications that leverage front-end development technologies, of course, and include that documentation directly in there. This takes single sourcing to whole new levels. So in this video, I have presented some of my ideas and thoughts around what I call dynamic documentation. And in summary, what are some of the advantages and disadvantages? Naturally, there are a few. These are all relatively new tools, especially in the context of being used for documentation sites. DocuSaurus is of course more mature and optimized for documentation, but it's a little harder to customize and get it to do some of the features and functionality I have mentioned here. Astro is more flexible, not really optimized for documentation, and it moves quickly sometimes breaking things. There are other options in this JavaScript world. Next.js, Vue.js, and Gatsby are all also JavaScript frameworks that offer some form of content handling, but this leads me to my main point. These are all primarily developer-focused tools. They are full of assumptions, jargon, and pitfalls that will have many of us and our tech writer developer experience brains twitching with frustration. You may have a development team or a developer available to help you out. After all, you are using some of the same tools that they're probably also already using. Depending on your company and team sizes, this could have other issues, as instead of using something more off the shelf, you may end up with custom solutions that take time to maintain, and if the person who created or maintains them leaves, then finding someone to replace them could be challenging too. But, you know, if you stick to some of the standard ways of doing things as much as possible, you obviously also open yourself up to a wider selection of people from the front-end development world as opposed to specific documentation tooling. However, 
the whole. Everything is a component paradigm and technologies like MDX are fairly well entrenched in the wider technical community and are somewhat here to stay for the time being at least. So I would say they do make sense for explanatory content as well. So like many other topics in technology, and I'm sure you have a long list of things you want to investigate and look into, it is also worth looking into. I have been Christian Schiller talking to you about some of my random, rough, rambling ideas and concepts around dynamic documentation. If you found this interesting or you have any questions, please leave a comment below. Or you can get in touch with me at christianchiller.com where I'm always happy to talk more. Thank you very much for joining me. Take care, everybody.